Hello, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics, and specifically the politics uh, side of the school. My name is Maurice McCorrig. I'm a senior lecturer uh, in the school, and I'm joined here today by three of my colleagues. Now, before I do anything, I'm going to show you uh, their names, our names on the screen. So hopefully everybody can see that. So I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Elodie Fabra, who's an expert in comparative politics by Dr. Stefan Andreessen, who works on American politics and political economy. And finally, my colleague, Dr. Andrew Thompson, who works in international relations and does a lot of work on um, conflict studies as well. So delighted uh, to have the opportunity just to talk about uh, what we thought would be um, a, a useful topic to talk about in, at the moment, this is uh, COVID-19 and and pandemics and how we might think of these and you know what the discipline of the various sub-disciplines within politics might um, teach us or what perspectives it can offer us on pandemics. So I might go to Elodie first if that's okay and ask um, yeah any reflections that you might have Elodie on, on pandemics I guess maybe within a UK context a lot of your work is on the devolved nature of the UK. Yes thank, thank you Mirish but I thought there were two big issues. One is more the comparative politics one. That also applies in the UK context and there's also a, a, a devolution dimension for this. And so one of the big questions we always ask is what do states do? And that's a big question of, uh, of political science. And when you think about COVID-19, suddenly you're asking a lot of questions about what states do, state capacity, their ability to react quickly to, to events. Uh, and that's what we can see really in a comparative perspective. There's very few countries that have not been affected by COVID-19. And so we can see what the sort of governments have tried to mitigate, obviously, the uh, medical health uh, impact of this pandemic and the sort of policies in this area that have been uh, adopted. But also we've seen uh, the adoption of policies to mitigate the economic impact and uh, the uh, the social impact. So it's very interesting to see and compare how different uh, states uh, have adopted different types of policies in relation to um, mitigating the impact of the pandemic and controlling the epidemic. Mm -hmm. And that has had all sorts of implications just about health systems, but also we've seen about like, controlling populations, telling people to stay at home, which is not something that states uh, regularly do, or uh, controlling their movement and the issue of surveillance of citizens uh, as well. And then there are all sorts of um, social policies well, that have been adopted as people were being suddenly furloughed or losing their job, and you can see a lot of countries, the expansion of sort of social safety nets uh, that le leads also to questions about deficits, but that question about how do we make sure that this pandemic does not create even further inequalities that we have uh, has been something that's been very prevalent, particularly in the European context. Uh, and then you can see as well, where does the colour of the political party in government matters? Because then you can see if um, you've got maybe more populist governments. So if you can think, for instance, of Trump in the US or Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil, uh, trying to, you know, sort of mitigate the idea that there's a big pandemic and also trying to limit the impact on public spending. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at the European context, for instance, you will see a country like the UK that's governed by a conservative party actually suddenly spending a lot of money uh, after years of austerity. So you can see as well that not all, uh, you might have differences between socialist governments in Europe and more conservative governments, but the conservative governments have also usually had to spend uh, a lot of money there. Mm -hmm. And the final point on the issue of the UK and devolution uh, is, has been an interesting one because you've heard a lot of UK politicians, Westminster-based politicians, complaining about the lack of a joint approach to controlling uh, COVID-19. And that, you know, with different dates to start, lo start lockdowns and uh, now different dates to uh, exit lockdowns. Uh, but then at the same time, you can wonder, that's actually one of the good things about devolution, that it allows different parts of the country that have different health systems. There is no UK health system uh, to uh, adapt uh, to what's happening 
It also uh, allows adaptation to diff different geographies. Northern Ireland, you know, traffic is pretty much stopped from the rest of the UK. So we haven't got the problems of Wales uh, trying to control the arrival of people from England into Wales, etc. So that's another issue about, you know, coordinating of policies in a developed context uh, or, or not. Thank you, Elodie. Wow, that's a huge amount of food for thought straight away on that uh, in respect, as you say, to party politics and, and, and in the devolved UK context as well. Um, I might uh, go directly then uh, to uh, Stefan to say, well, going to look at the United States or more internationally and um, the sort of global economy, what are your thoughts about um, COVID-19, the pandemic and what it means? <laughs> Right. Uh, I think like everyone else, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it means as we speak. Um, well, uh, as a political economist, uh, certainly the COVID pandemic has impacted my research and my teaching in lots of different ways. And I've just finished teaching uh, two modules this spring, one on global energy politics and one on American politics. So I thought I'd speak and make a few points about the impact of COVID in those two areas. So the first one then is energy politics. And as you may have noted, uh, the COVID lockdown has caused economies all around the world to shut down. This means that we've seen a precipitous drop in the oil price. Indeed, for a while, uh, futures contracts in May were below zero dollars. That meant, in effect, that producers of oil were paying consumers to take the oil off their hands because there was no dem demand and their uh, storages were overflowing. So. There's a couple of things out of these more economic effects that have really big political consequences, I think. And one is uh, the effect on the transition that we're currently trying to affect away from fossil fuels towards renewables. So there's a chance there that the current environment might give us the opportunity to forge a global green deal and thus speed up that transition, which has of course huge implications for the global climate. Or it may be that since oil uh, prices are low and fossil fuels are currently cheap, we will use more of them, which of course will slow that transition down. That's one effect. The other thing that might happen is that a prolonged period of low oil prices might kill off the so-called shale revolution or the fracking revolution in the United States, because those shale producers are dependent on high prices. And if that happens, uh, first I should say that shale revolution, of course, has had huge geopolitical consequences. Among many other things, it has redefined the US's relationship with the Middle East. At least that has the potential to do so, uh, given that that's a relationship that's anchored historically in the dependence uh, in the US on Middle Eastern oil. So that could be shifted. And of course, it has a huge uh, impact on global development in terms of what it means for all those countries that are dependent on selling fossil fuels, including oil, uh, to gain revenues with which to finance development and so on. So that's the first bit. And then briefly on American politics. So we have a fairly big, I think, momentous uh, election coming up in the US in November. I suppose all US presidential elections are reasonably important, but it's probably fair to say that no president has pushed the boundaries of the office of president quite as Donald Trump has, at least not since FDR uh, in the wake of the Great Depression and during World War II. Uh, and normally, of course, um, a US president will run for re-election on a good economic record. And Trump's idea here has been that, well, the economy is doing well and unemployment is very low, so that will uh, get me re-elected in November. The COVID pandemic, of course, has upended this. Uh, and as you know, we've also seen uh, various protests emerging in the United States in recent weeks. Uh, on one hand, people have protested sometimes with arms against what they see as overbearing lockdown policies. And on the other hand, of course, Americans have protested against the recurrent problem of police brutality which is now then exacerbated by the sort of economic and social impact of the COVID pandemic that tends to hit America's minorities the hardest. So this puts Trump in a very difficult position. 
Um, this is very unusual circumstances, and I think it's always quite difficult to predict how a U.S. election will go. But normally, unless a U.S. president has a grip on the economy and social order in the run-up to an election, he will usually lose. The question, of course, is whether we need to throw the playbook out in the age of Trump. That's not quite clear. So in any case, those are a couple of areas of my teaching and research that are affected by the COVID pandemic. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Stefan. And yes, I should have said, of course, your expertise in energy politics, but that's really interesting that it relates to two of the modules you, you teach and the, the global context and the political economy context. Uh, I guess it's a, a nice lead on then to, to you, Andrew, and maybe you've had a chance to think about, um, yeah, some, some international relations contexts for uh, COVID-19 that you'd like to, to share with whoever's listening to this video. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mirish. Um, I think there's a lot of things actually that both international relations and its subdiscipline of conflict analysis can tell us about social and political effects of this uh, pandemic. Uh, what I wanted to do is just point out, I suppose, just a couple of issues, uh, really. Uh, the first is that uh, this pandemic has underscored the importance of international cooperation. Right? Uh, in order to halt the spread of COVID-19, governments around the world will have to cooperate with one another and cooperate um, with international institutions like the World Health Organization and the United Nations. Essentially, what we're confronting here is a kind of collective action problem, very similar to the issues of environmental uh, degradation, of, um, um, issues of environmental, uh, uh, what's the word for it, degradation or environmental uh, issues, um, whereupon essentially, you know, each country we're only as strong as the weakest link, right? So I know that recently a number of US academics, policymakers and powerful lobby groups have all written a letter to the Trump administration urging him to cooperate with China, because there's been some schisms there, as well as um, cooperate um, or reverse his track with uh, defunding uh, the World Health Organization um, to help co um, control this um, the coronavirus spreading. So in other words, international relations can teach us quite a lot about um, the problems where um, states do not cooperate and how that cooperation might be facilitated through international uh, organizations. Uh, the second issue that I wanted to sort of briefly mention is in conflict analysis, many have started to look at how coronavirus or COVID-19 has affected patterns of violence in civil wars, civil conflicts around the world. Uh, COVID-19 has made some people much more vulnerable to disease, hunger and poverty. It's essentially uh, exacerbated some of the effects of, of war and conflict. Um, and, and it also, in, in doing that, has also made um, many groups more vulnerable to armed factions and or predation right, uh, by those armed groups. Uh, so the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for a global ceasefire. He called for a global ceasefire for all conflicts around the world. Uh, some armed groups and governments in various countries have complied, others have not. Now, it's an interesting and I suppose developing area of research is to see both what the effects of COVID-19 are on the dynamics of violence within certain conflicts, but also how states respond to these, uh, how states and armed groups respond to these calls for, for, for ceasefire and whether or not they, they actually um, stop uh, fighting with Thanks. I think that's it. I think that's it for me. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, well, thank you to all three of you. I mean, I asked you just to have um, some a couple of minutes of thoughts and you've really given a tour de force there of uh, it does feel a bit like the tip of the iceberg that uh, COVID-19, the pandemic is going to be the effects of this are going to be with us for a long time across the whole range of politics from the national dimension to the international political economy, energy, conflict, interstate relations. It's extraordinary. I mean, uh, this time last year, who would have for six months ago, who would have thought any of this? Um, for those of you listening to this video, I hope this gives you a bit of a, a flavour of um, some of the issues, some of the concepts, and some of the uh, questions uh, that we look at when we study politics, and particularly in the School of Politics, um, or sorry, the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics in Queens. Um, our politics grouping is one of the largest on these islands, certainly the largest on the island of Ireland. And we have here just uh, three of us. There's uh, 10 times as many staff. Um, and so there's a, a, a quite a range of areas uh, that we cover within the school. So if you are interested in coming to study politics, we 
you know, and if you're interested in the effects of COVID-19, we really want to hear from you. And so log on to the Queen's website or Google HAP at Queen's and you'll find more details. And I just want to say thank you to my colleagues. I will try and finish this video by switching back to the screen with all of our names on it and, uh, and end the recording. But uh, thank you again to Elodie, to Stefan and to uh, Andrew for their thank you. time. Yes. Take care. Bye.